the Western <clears throat> media has quite rightly been paying a lot of attention to Ukraine these days. But there are a lot of other troubling situations around the world in uh, Myanmar, former Burma, um, where there was a military coup and a very nasty situation developing, and Ethiopia, where there's a multifaceted civil war going on, and Yemen, where you have, again, a multifaceted civil war, but with uh, important outside participation. And you have other situations like this where one might say, here we go again. We keep saying never again, never again the Holocaust, never again these terrible atrocities. Uh, you, you have the Syrian civil war. And, and we say, how, how can all of this be transpiring again when we have promised in the past that we, the people on the planet, ought to do something about it. In fact, back in 2005, I guess it was, the United Nations, the General Assembly, adopted a resolution that had some language which we now refer to as making up the responsibility to protect. This was a statement, which I'm sure Tom will um, explain in some detail, but it was a broad statement about the responsibility of governments, both the ones that were facing atrocities like genocide or ethnic cleansing or major violations of the laws of war, and uh, also outside governments had a responsibility in all of this. Uh, governments had a responsibility to exercise their sovereignty responsibly, and other sovereign states had an obligation to uh, see to it that atrocities were prevented or curtailed or stopped. And yet we see Myanmar, Ethiopia, Yemen, South Sudan, always the eastern provinces of Democratic Republic of Congo, etc. How is it that you had this nice language I call them nice norms. We had these nice principles uh, as far back as 2005, if not before. And yet we, we still see protracted conflicts and ongoing atrocities. What's going on? How can this be? Well, that's the origin of the series. And Tom is going to uh, give us an overview to start with, and then we'll have a speaker that focuses on the Middle East and a speaker on East Asia and a speaker on Africa. So we'll go into some of the details in the course of the series. As I say, it's not a happy story, but I wouldn't want to suggest at the outset that nothing can be done. And I suspect our speakers will tell us that something has been done. You can do economic sanctions, you can do other things, uh, certainly at the core of this debate is the possibility of outside use of military force, so-called humanitarian intervention, to bring an end to some of these atrocities. So that's the nature of the four-part series. And again, we start with a general overview, and then we go into some of the details on a regional basis. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have a uh, batting leadoff, as it were. Tom Weiss, uh, not just a colleague of mine, but a friend of mine. He is a distinguished professor, uh, I think presidential professor, it's called, at the City University of New York. He also has an appointment at the moment in Chicago with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, if I have that title right. He has had a close-up view of the subjects of humanitarian uh, intervention and what it means to exercise responsible sovereignty and all of that. He has worked for various units of the UN system, for example, the International Labor Organization. He has uh, written more books than I can recall on the subject of international relations, 
the United Nations Humanitarian Intervention, Humanitarian and Affairs. He writes books faster than I can read them. And he has a very long list of uh, uh, distinguished, uh, often cited publications. He has been the editor of important international journals. He just has a long list of distinguished contributions. And we're exceedingly fortunate that uh, his schedule allowed him to give us an overview of mass atrocity and the responsibility to protect, explaining maybe why um, the nice wording has proven very difficult to implement in the world as it is. Tom, we are delighted that you can be with us tonight. Uh, thanks, David, for those excessively kind words. Um, you know, when you asked me to talk and you said, I said, well, how long should I speak? You mentioned something like 40 or 45 minutes. I agreed with alacrity, but I didn't tell you why, um, which was that um, the last time I taught undergraduates, which was a long time ago, but when I was at Brown before moving to the City University of New York, we always passed out these questionnaires, you know, what do you like, what do you dislike, what did he do, what he did not do. And I always found them a little tedious because they sort of add up and too much reading, too little reading, he talks too much, he doesn't talk enough, etc. But there was always one last question which I very much liked, which was a kind of open-ended question. And I would flip through these, these um, evaluations. I finally came up with one one day which said, uh, if I had a terminal disease, where would I like to spend the last hour of my life? And of course, the answer was in Lisa's seminar, because the last one seemed like eternity. <laughs> so I will try to uh, respect the 45 minutes. Um, you, you mentioned my involvement with R2P. I actually was the research director for something called the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which spawned the notion. So this means that I have an excessively well-informed view, but it also means that you may have to uh, take a lot of what I say with a large grain of salt, because for me, it was one of the more um, rewarding, interesting, stimulating parts of my career. Um, and I'd have to say that the, the commission, uh, I say in, in retrospect, is a remarkable human rights achievement, despite, as you've already pointed out, the contested application in Libya, or non-application in Syria, Myanmar, and the list goes on. Um, it rests, I think, and I'm gonna to try to explain this on ethical, political, legal, and operational foundations. But as you've already mentioned, um, we keep uttering never again, one more time again. So what I'd like to do in this time is to do try to do four things, right? go to a little bit of history, what happened before this notion came on. The commission's report was published in 2001. It was approved by the General Assembly or many aspects of it were in 2005 uh, at the World Summit. Uh, the second section, I'd like to talk a little bit about the work of the commission uh, because one of the things that I am convinced is that the importance of norms and the importance of individual outside voices in putting new ideas on the table and the commission, I think that did that better than most actually. Um, the third is to take a look at contemporary politics, which you've already thrown on the table, Dave. And fourth, I'd like to sort of look at the enduring debate and where we might be going from here. So, one of the root causes of humanitarian crises always has been obviously governments or non-state actors uh, disregarding their human, the basic human right to life of its populations. So what can be done? Uh, and the result after a couple of years of work uh, is the responsibility to protect R2P uh, for those of you who like acronyms. Um, military force is intrinsically political but one of the questions is, can specific uses be recognized as genuinely serving humanitarian purposes? 
And if so, what are the criteria for deploying force for human protection purposes? And what's been the impact and what's the future? Well, the history of looking at genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing is horrifying in at least two ways. Uh, the first regards how such atrocities end empirically, if we look back over uh, not just the, <laughs> this century and the last century, but before is most seem to end when the perpetrators decide that their objectives have been achieved. So we can think about the German campaign against the Herero in Southwest Africa, the Armenian genocide and the list goes on. However, in a couple of noteworthy instances, perpetrators have been defeated militarily, such as the Nazi regime during World War II. So the second horrifying realization consists of the politics of applying the adjective, and this is gonna be a theme I'm gonna go through tonight. The adjective, the H word, humanitarian, to acts of intervention, because in many cases, its application has been manipulated or dismissed or covered up a huge number of things that were anything except humanitarian. So uh, we can go back, in fact, uh, to something that's not a contemporary armed conflict, um, but the peace of Westphalia. And if uh, you sat through David's lectures, you know that this is the birth of the contemporary system that we call the international systems. But Many of the actors in that conflict, just as they are today, invoked a right or a duty even to protect those who shared their faith or their culture or their language. So the Peace of Westphalia sort of settled this dispute by giving uh, the decisions over those religious or ethnic or language populations under the authority of a central state. It could be argued, I think, that the establishment of states was and remains a solution of sorts to protection, even though a lot of them are perpetrators of abuse, but it is a solution of source. Uh, and it was facilitated in many ways by humanitarian concerns. If we move to the 18th century, and I'm gonna go through this very quickly, um, I think if you look at the, uh, the one of the earliest instances was the, the Russo-Turkish War that gave Russia, and this sounds a little familiar too, uh, the right to protect Christian minorities in parts of the Ottoman Empire. Later in the 19th century, the Council of Europe uh, looked at the vehicle for security and human rights governance by stopping massacres of Greeks by Turks, France intervened in Syria to protect Christian minorities uh, and other Christian populations on Crete and elsewhere. Russia's war against the Ottoman Empire resulted in the independence of Bulgaria and the protection of, of Christians there. The advocates of many of these, and your word processor will not like this, is called the atrocitarians. Hmm. So in some instances, this humanitarian ideology was co-opted by frankly disastrous imperial project. I've already mentioned some of them, but if we fast forward a little, we have the Congo Free State uh, in which uh, King Leopold uh, <laughs> was involved in genocide in order to uh, benefit his kingdom in his own purse, frankly. In 1898, the United States drew on a similar perspective to vindicate the liberation of Cuba, uh, which was purportedly, uh, this purportedly prevented atrocities by Spain. And we can look through similar instances in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Britain, Russia, other European powers. However, it's in the 20th century, let's just fast forward to, to Japan and Manchuria, fascist Italy and Ethiopia, Nazi Germany and Czechoslovakia, and the defeat of those aggressive powers and the atrocities that were entailed led to something we call the UN Charter, which led to some explicit restrictions on the use of force, especially when it came to violating the right of sovereign states, those 
beast that came out of the Treaty of Westphalia. Furthermore, as part of the decolonization process, which gained uh, a certain amount of speed in the late 40s and by the mid 60s was virtually over, new member states reiterated the commitment of international organizations to restrictions on intervention, led to statements such as the Declaration on Principles of International Law Concerning Friendly Relations. So, these agreements were firmly grounded in the notion of state sovereignty, which meant basically anything I do behind the borders of my sovereign state is permissible, sort of. This is sovereignty as control. So with this past as a prelude, it's easier to understand why former colonies, something I'd like to get to in a minute, in the global South could be excused for not forgiving the sins of the colonial powers and looking askance upon anything that was labeled humanitarian, any sort of humanitarian packaging of intervention. So it's important to fast forward to some of the critics, um, now critics in the global South, because obviously uh, it was easy enough to criticize uh, the Soviet Union and Hungary and Czechoslovakia, the United States, and the Dominican Republic and Grenada, Belgium and the Congo, et cetera. Um, but developing countries actually took up this practice and in retrospect, kind of justified what was going on. First, India and East Pakistan in December of 1971 to liberate what would become Bangladesh. And after perhaps as many as 3 million had been people had been killed, probably 10 million at least had fled. India argued that Pakistan had committed refugee aggression by creating this displacement. Second, Vietnam overthrew the Khmer Rouge. No tears were really shed when Vietnam uh, in December of 1978 decided to end the killing fields that had resulted in probably a couple of million, maybe two and a half million people or a quarter of the population. Third, Tanzania deposed Idi Amin uh, after he had begun targeting ethnic minorities, not just Asians, but others as well, killed only a half a million people. So yet from far from settling the issue or forging acceptance of any norm of intervention, these events toss more gasoline on an already controversial humanitarian fire. So I go into this history because if we fast forward toward the end of the, the, the Cold War, the French in particular, who had been criticized for many of the operations they had undertaken in the past in the name of humanitarian intervention, had a couple of people on board, namely the minister, his name is Bernard Kouchner, who had been one of the founders of the Doctors Without Borders movement, and a lawyer named Mario Bittati, and they worked on something called the droit d'ingérence, the right to interfere or to intervene. And the debate began at that point and gained momentum in the 1990s, which is where I'd like to really begin the detailed history. When he was newly elected Secretary General, Boutros Boutrosiali argued the time of absolute and exclusive sovereignty, this is a quote, has passed. Its theory was never matched by reality. It's the task of leaders of states today to understand this and find a balance between the needs of internal governments and the requirements of a more interdependent world. Shortly thereafter, the UN development programs report, published their annual report and dealt with a sublink of human security. And the, 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 the concept of security, this is their quote, has been too long been interpreted narrowly as a security of territory from aggression not the protection of individual human beings. Two crises of the, the, the crisis late in 1990s stand out 
And these two crises acted as the bookends for the International Commission, Commission on Intervention of State Sovereignty. Rwanda's real-time genocide in 1994, when clearly too little happened too late to stem the real-time slaughter of 800,000, maybe a million people. Later in the decade, in 1999, the war in Kosovo, where actually NATO ultimately came to the rescue uh, and stopped mass human rights violations, but they did so without the approval of the Security Council. So many critics said this was too much too soon. Moscow and Beijing vetoed this, and I want you to keep those two crises, too little, too late, too much, too soon. Uh, but in any case, the Security Council, the United Nations, was unable to come to the rescue of people. Who, millions of people talking about human rights abuse, the millions of deaths. So one of the interesting things, at least as a student of international relations, is that the, the work and I'm going to use this awful acronym, ICUS, uh, uh, but the work of the commission, I think, was demand-driven. That is, states had been involved in a series of crises in the 1990s, uh, including the Balkans, and whether that was Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, or later Kosovo. Um, Somalia, to start off the decade, I already mentioned Rwanda. East Timor, states actually were looking for guidance. I'd say this is quite different from some of subsequent looks at issues, in which i say was supply-driven. That is, that a couple of donors or a couple of member states decided that human security or human development were decent ideas, but there was no meeting of the minds. Here, there was actually a consumer for the report by the commission. The debate really began in earnest after Kosovo, so supposedly too much too soon, after Rwanda, nothing at all. Uh, and Annan, Kofi Annan at the time, the Secretary General, um, wrote an article in The Economist, which he called two sovereignties. So not just one sovereignty, not just the sovereign who <laughs> occupies the central government and supposedly has exercises authority over the country. But there are two sovereignties, an international norm in favor of intervention to protect civilians from wholesale slaughter, as well as government rights. So this dual responsibility, internal and external, drew substantially from what I would say is the pioneering work of uh, uh, Sudanese Dinka, Francis Dang and Roberta Cohen at the Brookings Foundation who were looking at internally displaced persons, people who were within their country, but had situations that were akin to refugees, but had no, no institution taking care of them. There was no law covering them. In fact, the law that covered them was the same one that gave the, the authorities the right to repress them. They had called something sovereignty as responsibility. That is that as a sovereign, you obviously had rights, but you also have responsibilities, and the primary responsibility is to your own population to protect their rights. So, part of their argument, which was picked up later, uh, frankly, was the idea that there was a, maybe not a duty, but the need for the international community of states embodied in the UN and mandated since its creation to deliver what Roosevelt called the freedom from fear to do everything possible to prevent mass atrocities in particular. So the problem really was not just internal groups in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, but when the state was the main perpetrator of use. So the, the reason that Deng and Cohen came up with this notion was that you couldn't expect the government that was causing the problem to protect the people whom they were repressing. This set the scene, I think, for the International Commission. In September of 2000, the Canadian government 
which took the lead in um, pushing this forward as it, you know, those years took the lead in pushing landmines and a series of other issues at the United Nations. They assembled and financed a, a group of what you might call eminent persons uh, to analyze the debate and to say, how can we get around this circular argument, digging a deeper trench that states can do what they want, they have absolute sovereignty. At the same time, we all agree that human beings have rights as well. The 12 people who compose the, the group, the, the model now is not quite Noah's Ark. We have six from the South and six from the North. Um, and try to look for some new ideas to address the issue. So um, after 13 consultations around the world, a whole series of research reports, uh, ICUS settled on a reformulation of sovereignty which underscored the states have authority in protecting people within their jurisdiction, but when they are unable or unwilling to manifestly unwilling to do so, the Security Council possesses the authority to address the situation. The commission essentially argued for reconceiving the issue to focus on the rights of the victims of atrocity rather than those of the states. The commissioner just drew on Deng and, and uh, Cohen. But they found three responsibilities. The first and the most important, although it's one we do least well, the responsibility to prevent. So long before a humanitarian crisis breaks out, it should be the international community of states should be engaged in promoting human rights, development, and peace to avert conflicts. Well, we don't do that very well. The second responsibility, so the responsibility to prevent, the second one, and this was the crux of the deliberations by the commission, the responsibility to react. If a compelling crisis occurs, it should take measures to stop violence and, and the circumstances that feed that violence. It could be military intervention, could be sanctions, could be international judicial review. But in those instances, sovereignty is no longer sacrosanct or the old form of sovereignty in which a state can do whatever it wishes behind its border no longer applies. And the third responsibility was to rebuild after military force or anything else is used. There's a responsibility to come back and try to put the country back together again. So as I say, the, the responsibility to react including military intervention, was the focus. And the focus of the intervention against the wishes of a government or without its genuine consent has made some modest steps over the last quarter century, made humanitarian issues possible in areas where, that were previously out of bounds. I'd like to emphasize the extent to which determining whether, when, where, and why, whether, when, where, and why to interview, intervene to protect civilians caught in the crosshairs of war and violence, increasingly are guarded by the responsibility to protect, by the notion that sovereignty is not absolute, it's conditional. The bar may not be very high. We're not talking about the garden variety of human rights abuse, but we're talking about mass murder, we're talking about mass ethnic cleansing, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and ethnic uh, cleansing. With the possible exception, uh, we're not sort of 20 years after the publication of the, the report in 2001, as David mentioned, uh, 2005, officially approved or agreed by the General Assembly with lots of second thoughts. Um, but with the exception, I'd have to say, of Raphael Lemkin's advocacy for the 1948 Genocide Convention, and no idea, not necessarily action, but no idea, no norm has moved faster or farther in the normative arena. Friends and foes alike actually point to the Commission's conceptual contribution which I think is basically twofold. Reframing sovereignty as contingent 
rather than absolute. And the second is that the rights of, we're not emphasizing the rights of outsiders, not the right side, outside of outside military powers to intervene. We're emphasizing the rights of civilians on the ground, their rights to protection and to assistance and the responsibility of outsiders to come to the rescue. There is no obligation. There, there are very few obligations in international affairs, but responsible states should at least feel embarrassed to remain on the sidelines when mass atrocities are underway. So the commission coined the term the responsibility to protect to help move beyond the pitch battles of humanitarian intervention in which there's absolute state sovereignty and absolute the rights of intervention to look for some middle ground. And I'd like to recount just a short story because when we presented the report to Secretary General Annan in December of 2001, he who had been grilled by members of many developing countries in particular, in the General Assembly, when he spoke about two sovereignties, looked at the responsibility to protect and said, ah, I wish I had thought of that. There was a new middle ground in which the conversation could occur, even if there was still lots of contention, as I will explain in a moment. So four years later, the 150 heads of state in 2005 approved this on the UN 60th anniversary. Uh, well, I am an enthusiast, uh, as you can tell. I don't go quite as far as uh, Anne Marie Slaughter, who called it the International Magna Carta. That, that hyperbole is unjustified. I do think it's changed the conversation. Uh, and the notion of humanitarian intervention that had led to circular tirades, at least the responsibility to protect allows a conversation. While Rwanda, in fact, was a, a, a conversation stopper for people who said humanitarian intervention is never under any circumstances is it allowable. Even in the Africa, which was perhaps the most hostile to, toward the notion, it was hard for defenders of absolute state sovereignty to say, oh yeah, you know, we're on it, that's okay. So there was a new middle ground plowed here. Um, and so in short, sovereignty no longer provides a license for mass atrocities in the eyes of legitimate members of the international community of states. Every state has the responsibility to protect its own citizens that's its primary responsibility from widespread human rights abuses. But if any state is unable or unwilling to exercise that responsibility, or is actually the perpetrator of atrocities, its sovereignty is temporarily abrogated. And the responsibility to protect those civilians in distress devolves to other states, ideally acting through the Security Council. David, you mentioned Myanmar in the opening section to name the most egregious of recent cases, I think, of mass atrocities demonstrates that, uh, you know, a robust RTP response is not automatic. Universal norms are subject to geopolitics. Uh, nevertheless, it remains unusual for countries to come to the rescue militarily because they're at the risk of quagmire. But wagering on corrective spinelessness is a better bet than on collective security. But occasionally, just occasionally, there's not a double standard. There's frankly, a, which is that we, we, we used to have a single standard. Now we have a double standard. Single standard was never do anything. Now we have a double standard. Occasionally we do something, not in every case, but in some cases. I, I want to emphasize once again, the bar is very high, not against just the run of the mill abuse, but crimes against humanity, genocide, ethnic cleansing, 
the conventional interpretations of privileges for sovereign states have made room for the responsibilities in the most dire of human crises. Now, there are a huge number of critics. I, care, I can go on and on about this. You know, David Reef, who was a former advocate for humanitarian interventions, has de declared um, our uh, uh, RIP or, or, or acquiescence in Pache for R2P, uh, especially after the paralysis in Syria, whose humanitarian justification would have been far easier than Libya's. Um, critics are uncomfortable with military priority settings, but I'd argue that the death knell has not sounded for R2P. The essential takeaway is that if consent is an essential building block for traditional humanitarianism, R2P represents a normative departure, a co coercive form of humanitarianism that increasingly characterizes discourse and, as I say, occasionally action. This reflects, I think, as I said earlier, a demand for some guidance. Unlike disarmament or sustainable development or human securities, who were terrific forward-looking ideas, but were driven more by the, the supply of those ideas than a demand for those ideas. So, let me just say, so I, I could spend some time in questions and answers if people are interested in the device of the commission, what something I've called part of the third UN in which member states and members of secretariats are assisted in normative development by outsiders of various sorts. But the report from the International Commission does not just stay in bookshelves or filing capitals. It's infused debate. There are research group, there's a professional journal, there are books on the subject, there's a group of friends in New York, there are military groups working on this. This doesn't mean that we're having um, responsibility to protect uh, as a daily bill of fare. And so you may want to grab your cell shaker but it does influence contemporary debate. Now, given the lack, we wanted a little contemporary politics, um, given the fact that we cannot agree that international cooperation in the face of a pandemic or climate change, um, it's a little hard to go back and explain the almost giddy sensation that actually greeted the issue of humanitarian intervention during the 1990s and the early 2000s. I say, I, I'm gonna argue, and I would be happy to go on at greater length, but I won't, the, the R2P idea is alive, it's not in life support. And it occupies what I'd say is a middle ground in international debate. We've seen not only the decisions uh, of governments uh, in the General Assembly, We've seen courts cases in the ICJ um, and in something that, as I say, I think is important for political scientists to ideas become embedded. Um, as I say, it's impossible to have this conversation in New York without citing r 2 k There is a part of the secretariat headed by a special advisor on r 2 p There is a, um, it's been an annual debate in the General Assembly. It's impossible to, to uh, avoid this issue. There's a large coalition of NGOs working on this issue. There's something called the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. There are 50 member states from the North and the South who are friends of R2P every time there is a, a crisis that, that meet. As I say, this doesn't guarantee action, but it does guarantee that the subject does not disappear. The loudest voices of dissent in the old days and those that remain, who see the responsibility to protect as a Trojan horse of Western imperialism or worse, has a certain amount of resonance still 
but they that resonance occurs mainly in such human rights bastions as Zimbabwe and Venezuela and Sudan and Myanmar, along with Russia and China. While the criticism remains, it's become far more deeply ingrained in conversations, just routine conversations, diplomatic conversations, military conversations. And what my um, Indian colleague and commissioner and sidekick Ramesh Thakur has, has written, norm displacement has taken place from the entrenched norm of non-aggression to the new norm of the responsibility to protect. And I think that's a, an actually a, a fair statements. So let me just hear David move toward um, a bit of a conclusion. Um, after all is said and done, the debate now is no matter how politically fraught and militarily perilous, military intervention and other non-consensual non intervention is permissible and achievable. At its roots, R2P reiterates just war principles. Um, the, the, the commission has an entire chapter. We don't call it just war doctrine because that sounds like too much Christian West, but it really consists of the same principles that one would uh, bring to bear. Uh, maybe not Aquinas, but, but uh, um, Michael Ignatieff anyway. Uh, in coming to the rescue, one needs to respect just war doctrine. Uh, and the center, the Security Council, which is the centerpiece for our 2 p actions, because it renders decisions about the legitimacy of specific cases, and it can call on the resources. Unfortunately, the, the Security Council, as in lots of other things, is increasingly paralyzed. And I suspect that if any R2P or anything resembling R2P action is going to happen, it's going to happen the way Kosovo did outside of the Security Council. But it is important if you're trying to measure avoiding this topic or acting on the topic or finding an excuse not to act on the topic. The Security Council has invoked the responsibility to protect all and about 85 times. The Human Rights Council in Geneva about 50 times. And the General Assembly, the last time it looked at this in May of 2021, was the first vote in decades on the issue. Uh, basically, it was about 115 for and 15 against with the 30 abstentions. But I think that's a very good snapshot of the consensus about the the concept, not the consensus about action. Uh, actually, a late friend of both David uh, and uh, I mean Ed Luck, uh, who was the special advisor on our, our responsibility to protect, said, "Like most infants, our two P will need to walk before it can run." Nonetheless, and I think I'm going to end here. Many victims will suffer and die if our two P's adolescence is postponed. Uh, the process begun by the commission continues to be a cause for civil society and supportive governments that try to push skeptical countries and UN bureaucracy to take secretary generals and others earlier rhetorical call to translate words into deeds. And that, in fact, is where we are and we may be for some time. So I think I'm gonna stop there. That was my, I hope, something like 40 or 45 minutes, Dave. Let me stop for a minute there. Thank you, Tom. We'll, uh, we'll just pause here a little bit and give people a chance to uh, pose some questions through the chat function. They will go to the moderator and I think the moderator will, um, screen them and decide what to ask. Uh, I, I, Tom, I was... Uh, yeah, I'm stretching, but go ahead, David. <laughs> I, I was struck by uh, your reference to Ralph Lemkin and his development of the idea of genocide. And you were suggesting that this commission called by the Canadian government 
and bringing together a number of high profile people in international relations was another example of a person or a group of persons who could actually make a difference in world affairs. And in this case, change the discourse, get more attention to the rights of civilians and the duties of governments. I wonder if you could expand on that. I also thought about Hirsch Lauterpacht because he was the one that came up with the notion of a crime against humanity. And so there are these people like Ralph Lemkin, and there are these people like Hirsch Lodepak, uh, and, and there are other people. It is possible for individuals and groups of individuals to have what we social scientists call agency. You can have impact, you can act, you can make a difference. But so far, it seems to me, all of this is about discourse. All of this is about ideas. We have the idea of genocide, but we don't stop genocide in the real world. We have the idea of crimes against humanity, but actually there's uh, systematic attacks on civilians. So the commission did yeoman's work in talking about ideas, about how state sovereignty was not absolute, and we also needed to think about human security. But then how about some commentary on translating ideas into effective concrete action? You'd like me to come up with a few concrete solutions on how to do so. Um, you and I are in the business of coming up with ideas, but I, I actually do think in all uh, honesty, sincerity, that the idea and a normative step is a, is a first and very awkward step in the right direction. In the same way that uh, slavery and women's rights and a whole series of things uh, have been being pushed, seemed outlandish at one point in time, small steps forward and half a step backwards. And, we can, I mean, you have to be, I think, to be in this business, you have to be an optimist and an inveterate optimist. Um, but I'd like to see that, I'd like to say that, as I say, on occasion, not systematically, on occasion, a step is taken in the right direction. I mean, just to think about Lemkin for a minute, um, and I'm going to, th th this may seem like an aside, but it's really not. One of the things that, um, Lemkin was very keen about was not just physical genocide, but cultural genocide in his original drafts of genocide, actually beginning in the 30s uh, at the League of Nations. Cultural genocide, the kind of thing that occurred beginning with Crystal Mack, and we've seen over the centuries, and we've seen much more recently with the Bamayun Buddhas, or we've seen uh, the Mostar Bridge, or we've seen the the, the shrines in the Timbuktu and the mosques, et cetera. Um, that was thrown out because it seemed um, outlandish. And it also was thrown out because the countries that were most to be on the hot seat were going to be the, the countries of the global north who actually had decimated indigenous populations and got rid of all kinds of things. And they didn't want to be responsible. So there's been this interesting flip, at least, in terms of the um, importance of trying to protect cultural heritage. That idea of Lemkins that went nowhere is now, I think, it's not back front and center, but it's back closer to the center of conversation. It's what it creates a huge opprobrium when the, the Chinese decide to pave over some mosques in Xinjiang. Uh, uh, it's what is one of the things that's driving criticisms of Myanmar and in terms of the Rohingya. Uh, and it seems to me it's, it was also one of the things that forced a reaction to Trump's outlandish notion of destroying Iranian cultural heritage in sort of a retaliation uh, in uh, January of uh, 2000, 
21. So this idea, which takes a very long time to germinate, is thrown out, comes back, um, is now, I think, somewhat closer to the center of conversation. And uh, my guess is that in 50 years from now, so, you know, that, that or at least my hope is that atrocity prevention would be occupy the same place that that slavery, which is still not dead, and we still have Mauritania and lots of other places, but it's not the way it was in 19, 1800 or 1900. Uh, and so it, it seems to me that we make small steps in a variety of ways. And one that usually starts with an idea and a norm that we ought to should do this or should at least try to do it more frequently than we have in the past. Um, and uh, so, as I say, I, um, I'm happy to have been associated with this. I, I'm still frustrated more than, <laughs> or as much as anybody about the lack of action to back up what seems like the new center of the agenda. We have a uh, question from one of the people in our um, audience this evening. Uh, you, you mentioned, I, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit. Uh, you talked about India moving into East Pakistan, Vietnam, into Cambodia, Tanzania overthrowing uh, Idi Amin in Uganda. You referred to the U.S. Uh, taking action to protect civilians in Kosovo in 1999. All of these examples have a fairly weak state as a target. Yep. What about US violations? Um, I, don't, I don't know that, well, some people would say, well, there was genocide against Native Americans in this country. Um, suppose the Canadians had wanted to intervene in the United States to uh, protect Native Americans uh, near the Canadian border. Suppose some of the Caribbean states had gotten together and wanted to intervene in the American South because of civil rights violations and so on and so forth. I, I'm aware of your distinction between run-of-the-mill human rights violations and mass atrocities in terms of mass murder, mass rape, mass killing, and all of that. Even so, what about the problem of very bad things happening in very powerful states? And do you think, for example, that all the discourse about the Uyghurs in China might actually over time have some effect on a very powerful state, which claims the old notion of sovereignty. We're sovereign. This is our business. You outsiders stay out. What do we do about the powerful states, not the weak states that allow these atrocities to occur? But uh, what about the problem of power? I have a simple solution for geopolitics. No. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is that um, I see the uh, very, very uphill argument being made against uh, China and, and, and the Uyghurs as a, if not a, <laughs> a futile gesture. It is basically a gesture at this point, but one that is seeking and the only real weapon that international organizations have is naming and shaming. And, um, the impact to date is very modest. The reason that intervention occurred in Libya was that the Arab League and there was a military capacity to do so. The reason it didn't happen in Syria is that the two major outside supporters on the Security Council, Moscow and Beijing, vetoed it. Uh, and there wasn't enough interest in anybody else's part to, as there was in Kosovo, to override that veto and act independently. Um, 
I, I think it's an impossible bar to um, hope that action against Mali, um, if the government falls apart and the protection of the the shrines in Timbuktu that have been partially put back together again and they can't control things. An effort there is conceivable. I think an effort in Ethiopia is conceivable. I think that in any action other than um, criticism is absolutely impossible because of the geopolitics of the, the situation. I mean, it's, the, it's almost the people criticize the veto power in the Security Council. Uh, we're not going to make the planet worse by taking action against a major power. Uh, there's going to be no decision to do so. There's no political will to do so, and there's no capacity to do so. So I think it is conceivable that we could take actions as actions occurred in the Balkans. I think it certainly would have been possible in Rwanda, um, but it's certainly impossible in China. One of our uh, listeners in the audience wants us to go back to the Bosnian War of the early 90s. And uh, I'm going to sort of exp expand on a very good, good uh, point that was made by our listener. Isn't it true that all of the nice norms and nice words and changes and ideas that you've been talking about in government capitals, these uh, good, progressive, reasonable, commendable ideas in government centers are always run through the prism of national interest, short-term national interest. So when you had the outbreak of the Bosnian War in the early 90s, and you had all kinds of atrocities, the US Secretary of State, James Baker said, we don't have a dog in that fight. Uh, you know, our, this doesn't affect our security. This doesn't affect our strategic thinking. And wasn't his view the same as the view held in the Netherlands at the time of the Srebrenica massacre, where the Dutch led UN security force didn't really want to take strong action and stop the massacre, which the world court has said constituted genocide because mm -hmm. the Dutch didn't want to get their people killed and didn't want to get sucked into a deeper quagmire. So the general question is, yes, uh, progressive thinking, good new ideas, but governments are always looking at these things in terms of their self-interest. Isn't that um, a kind of general persistent problem in applying the progressive thinking to real world situations? Uh, yes, right. but I presume we need a better answer than that. Um, the um, Many people, um, many critics of humanitarian intervention, R2P, guy like Mohammed Ayyub, um, would say that um, it only happens if there are the wrong kinds of national interests. You know, you want oil, so you do this, or you want to control um, the region, so you do that. Um, I would argue that if there are no perceived national interests, nothing will happen. Um, so that to take I mean, the Balkans cases, uh, I mean, we, to talk about separate ones, trying to determine when national interests were perceived as being sufficient enough for NATO to get involved to end the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, but I, let's take an easier case, I think. Um, the, the, I don't have a dog in the fight business. Um, Somalia, uh, which even, I, I mean, I, I know this because I, I had a debate about this. 
Uh, even he agreed that there were no U.S. national interests or virtually none, or they were totally dwarfed by the humanitarian concerns uh, in 1992 for the operation in Somalia. And the problem was that as soon as um, anything uh, hit the fan, uh, the United States pulled out. At that point, um, Tony Lake, who was working for Clinton at that point as the you know, uh, national security advisor, um, I basically had an argument with him because he said there were, no, you don't understand, Clinton could not have stayed in Somalia. And I said, wait a minute, you know, since we both did our dissertations at the same time, I knew him fairly well. I said, this is not what you're used to arguing, but in addition, is it not? possible even in Somalia to sort of reframe national interests, not just the humanitarian concerns, but to say that one, the US has serious commitments and we would say we're gonna do something, we don't pick up our toys and run. But two, and more importantly, is it not in US interest to live uh, in an international system in which war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, mass murder, uh, are not policy options. It seems to me that that, that that is the argument that needs to be made in order to make the kind of intervention that could make a difference, even when national interests are only modestly involved. There has to be at least some perception of national interest or nothing happens. Do you know of, this comes as paraphrasing another question that's come from our group. We, Sorry. we, we, uh, we talk about Rwanda where there wasn't forceful outside intervention except um, by, you know, one of the, um, the Tutsi uh, militant movements and so on and so forth, but there weren't outside states being involved. And we talk about the US bombing of Serbia over Kosovo. So we're talking about use of force and we're talking about that kind of intervention. Do you know, can you give us some examples where say at the UN, there's something done quietly. Uh, there's some diplomatic uh, initiatives under the table or secretly or something where these ideas are pursued on behalf of human security to prevent or stop or do something about attacks on civilians. But we don't, it, it's not major use of military force, but the, the UN or some other international organization plays a constructive role in the name of R2P but it's not big scale military force and it's not widely covered by the media and we don't hear about it. Actually, um, I would argue that several of the actions behind the scenes, not only by the UN, but by the African Union on a couple of occasions in Kenya in and around elections, um, using the argument in particular that um, when a church seemed to be surrounded in the um, <laughs> people inside and menacing noises basically that looked remarkably like what had gone on in Rwanda a few years before that. And that the hands of the negotiator who happened to be Annan, who was now the African Union um, negotiator along with a couple of other sidekicks managed to raise R2P without putting it in neon lights um, and made a difference there. Similarly, that happened in Guinea. It's happened in a couple of places, but um, <laughs> so this has happened. It doesn't get the kind of, and I undoubtedly don't know lots of other cases, but the ones I am aware of having done a little research in Kenya, um, it basically, the 
negotiators on the ground said, don't say R2P, just imply R2P because it's more effective diplomatically. So there, there are instances, and you know, if I were closer to some of these, I'd probably have some others, but at least those I know of. Uh, one of our uh, listeners wants to know, did the fact that both Bill Clinton and Kofi Annan apologized for not doing more in Rwanda, did that have any effect on anything? The admission that they should have done more. And of course, there's a story about why Kofi Annan didn't do more. You and I know that story. We don't have to recount it all here. But do, does that kind of public apology have any importance? Um, gosh, I don't know. Really We'd have to ask somebody elsewhere. But I do think what it did do, the specific case of Rwanda, uh, in relationship to people who worked with Clinton, uh, Susan Rice in particular, um, oftentimes pointed to that in debates in New York. And um, in and around um, Libya in particular, Lots of noises were made about, you know, do we want this to, I mean, Libya then became controversial for a different set of reasons. But the decision to act in February and March of 2011, numerous people, including ones who had been involved on the ground um, with the Clinton administration, pointed to those statements. So whether or not it was the apology or the realization that, um, do we really want this to happen again? And obviously such apologies didn't mean very much in the, the line that was supposedly drawn in the sand in Syria, but on the margins in the debate, in and around the decision to take action in Libya against Gaddafi uh, in February and March of uh, 2011, I think it was an important factor. And in fact, the decision, the first decision to basically, in UN terms, <laughs> to a forced march, the first Security Council decision approved everything except military force in a matter of days, a sort of breathless decision making in the Security Council. And the images actually more of of the Balkans because of the ethnic, you know, the, the way the, the, it looked to sort of the West coming in and the Muslims on the ground. But Rwanda was very much in the air. As I say, it was very much in the air in, in, in Kenya as well in and around the violence in the elections in 2007. So. One of our members uh, wants to get your views on the importance of US leadership on all of this. Uh, this uh, person is very much concerned about uh, political discourse in Nebraska at the moment where we have a gubernatorial race and we have a lot of rhetoric beating up on immigrants, for example. I would broaden that uh, to talk about sort of American foreign policy since 2016 covering a couple of administrations, the Trump administration, the Biden administration. Uh, how important is American leadership on these issues revolving around uh, response to mass atrocity, the ideas inherent in the responsibility to protect? Uh, could someone else, I mean, Canada took a leading role uh, back around 2000. Are there others besides the United States that might play a leading role in continuing to focus on human security, attacks on civilians, trying to do something, admittedly a difficult struggle to do something about these mass atrocities. How important is US foreign policy? Well, I think in every way, um, except military, 
other leadership is probably even more crucial. Unfortunately, if military action is involved, nothing happens without the United States. I mean, that's just the way it, way it is, but whether it's logistics, whether it's communications, whether it's um, uh, the, just the physical mass of troops that are involved, a U.S. decision is absolutely essential. On everything else, it's better that the U.S. stays in the background. Um, and um, I, I think that the um, it's going to take more than announcing that you know the U.S. is back uh, to put this issue uh, front and center. Um, in fact, given the other distractions these days, um, I, I say that this is definitely back burner material for the time being, um, um, but I, it, it will come back. It has to come back there. You know, the, it comes back routinely now anyway, but we haven't had uh, anything except the Uyghurs and we're not gonna do anything there. And Myanmar, which is, we're not gonna do anything because we're preoccupied elsewhere, except lead the rhetorical flourish against such atrocities. Um, but it, it seems to me that US leadership is essential, not just in the Security Council, but if anything military is gonna happen or if NATO is gonna be involved in any way at all. You mentioned three key items, three key stages in the responsibility to pr protect, and that was to prevent, to react, and to rebuild. I, I know particularly the third about rebuilding and I want to just get your thoughts on Libya, 2011. Yep. Obama says we're gonna lead from behind. We don't wanna get out in front. We'll let the French or we'll let the British or we'll let other Arab states uh, play a big role. We will stay in the background, an idea which you just uh, mentioned. And yet, if we look at Libya today, without going deep into the weeds on this, because we're going to have a later speaker on this, when there was a no-fly zone and a bombing campaign and all of that in 2011 in Libya, we didn't rebuild. It didn't work out well. And today, Libya is a mess. So could you comment on that? Um, and, uh, I mean, it, it actually. Um... That was actually a criticism I, I, I wrote at the time because in fact, um, it seemed so obvious. Um, and it was the same mistake I think that was made, I have to, have to say in, in, in Iraq, um, that there was no plan for the day after. And um, interestingly, when the, um, Commission was trying to sort this out. Um, the prevention and the rebuilding originally came in as a kind of a, a conceptual continuum. It made sense to do this. Um, and the emphasis should be on prevention, but yeah, we know nobody ever gets involved early. And so we're gonna have to react. And then the, the discussion about rebuilding was if you insist that if you're gonna react, you have a, a obligation to rebuild, no one will react. That was the argument at the time. Um, you know, if, if this is a necessary uh, component of agreeing to stop atrocities, we gotta put the, the om omelet back together again. No one's going to get involved. But the commissioners, I think to their credit, basically said, these, <laughs> it's a conceptual continuum and you can't possibly just react, stay at 35,000 feet and wave goodbye. You have to provide enough security afterwards. It seems to me that the, the, the alternative model here is probably Kosovo um, where there are still um, 40,000 NATO troops on the ground where a huge investment was made in um, the justice system, the penal system, um, the administrative system in which some combination of NATO, the European Union, 
the OSCE uh, and the UN uh, agreed to provide the kind of um, post intervention uh, rebuilding that's, that's actually necessary. So the, I think the contrast between Kosovo and Libya would be a good one. Um, and Libya is a mess. Kosovo is, you know, not exactly Eden, but it also uh, has a chance of staying together. And I, 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 so I think that's a much better, much better model. That's a good comparison. I really hadn't thought of. I'm glad you you brought up Kosovo as a counterpoint to Libya and maybe Iraq, where there wasn't enough attention to what happens after. Uh, the main use of military force. I'm not seeing a lot of new questions in the chat function, and we've been at this now for uh, almost an hour and a half. Um, I think I should give Tom a chance at a last comment, but I, I want to set that up, having been the one to invite Tom and uh, get us all into this quagmire. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you went back actually to the middle of the 17th century because you did have a great deal of violence in Europe. You did have Protestants and Catholics fighting each other, the Dutch and the Spaniards and all. And actually the, the idea of a territorial state which would pronounce on religion in that jurisdiction and settle that question was an attempt to get out of the violence that was occurring. And that was the sort of start of the state system of world affairs. And ever since the middle of the 17th century, we've been faced with the question of how to make states responsible, how to make states do the right thing how to make states uh, protect their people. And what do you do when you have rogue states, when you have repressive states, when you have autocratic states, when you have uh, states that don't do the right thing? And especially when they allow mass murder, mass rape, mass attacks on civilians, that's been a question that's been with us since the middle of the 17th century. <laughs> and, and it's still with us. And, and we're wrestling with a kind of age old dilemma. And there are people and organizations and groups that have made some progress, at least in thinking about this. We, we talked about uh, uh, Kushner, the French, uh, he was a cabinet member for a while, and we talked about uh, Lemkin, and I brought up some of these other people. So it seems to me we're, we're in this big historical process where we're trying to tame states and tame the state system, and there is room for individual contribution and new thinking but it's really a tough struggle and there are a few victories here and there or partial victories or temporary victories, but the struggle goes on. I, I give it to you to say what you like or dislike <laughs> about that historical summary. I, I, I think that probably um, we're not gonna find an answer to this before the end of your career and mine, um, but there should be work in the future. Um, as you say, we've been some of this. It's not new. We've been dealing with this for a very long time. Um, uh, you know, it seems to me that R two P is new. It remains new. It's become slightly more firmly embedded in international society. Occasionally, it gets embedded in institutions and policies and tactics sometimes even action in a particular crisis. Um, I think it certainly has, <clears throat> excuse me, the potential to evolve further in uh, customary international law. And it certainly has the capacity to influence ongoing conversations in New York and Brussels and elsewhere. 
Uh, and it seems to me the conversation about what constitutes a legitimate as opposed to a rogue sovereign, as you say, this has been going on for a long time. It will continue to go on. But it, I think it, what's happened to this is that, it, as I say, at least in addition to territory and authority and all those things that get wrapped up in the, the uh, Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States, there's now occasionally a modicum of respect for human rights that goes into a definition of a legitimate state. Um, and nothing I said should imply that, you know, obviously military force is hardly a panacea, uh, and hardly a cause for celebration. Um, and in fact, it's actually been missing in action actually since um, largely uh, since uh, Libya. Um, so I think that all of this, uh, I mentioned early that uh, atrocitarian is not a word that uh, your spell check will like. But in fact, Gary Bass in his history of uh, humanitarianism basically ends up by saying, uh, I mean, I had to, uh, we're all atrocitarians now, but only so far only in words and not yet in deeds. It seems to me that the deeds are occasional, they're far, few and far between, they're too few and far between, but they're not absent. And therefore, um, I think that it's frustrating individuals can make a difference, have made a difference. And as I say, um, you have to remain an inveterate optimist to be in this business. Um, otherwise you wouldn't have been in it in the first place. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Tom, for taking a Sunday evening to share some very important thoughts with us. We do appreciate that. And uh, I'll just say for those uh, of you who are still with us in the audience out there, uh, we have three more sessions looking in detail at different cases, different examples in different parts of the world. But we have this very fine opening overview uh, from um, one who knows as much about this subject as anybody around. So thank you very much, Tom, for uh, sharing your time with us. Okay. I hope I'll get out there for a stake with you guys one of these days, but who knows? Yeah, when, they, when, when, when the Huskers get a winning program, we'll, uh, we'll invite you to. No, no, no. It's uh, got to be before then, doesn't it? <laughs> thanks very much. And I'll sure. let the technical hosts terminate the program. Uh, I don't have the ability to do that. But thanks to all of you for tuning in, as it were, and staying with us uh, for this discussion. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. Bye.